On May 9, 1846, the American and Mexican armies face each other on the plains located near the north shore of the Rio Grande. The United States Army of Occupation must reach Fort Texas to relieve their comrades who have been under siege since May 3. The opposing Mexican army is blocking the way, they have found a defensive position they consider impossible to breach. In today's episode we will cover the crucial battle of Resica de la Palma. This confrontation took place just a day after the Battle of Palo Alto, which we covered in our previous three episodes. So, sit back, relax, and get ready to travel through time to witness a pivotal moment in history. In March 1836, the citizens of the Territory of Texas declared themselves independent from Mexico and formed the Republic of Texas. The Mexican government attempted to recover these lands but failed. In March 1845, American President John Tyler signed a Congress resolution to annex Texas. The resolution called for Texas to enter the United States directly as a new state, with its boundaries to be determined after annexation. Mexico, which considered Texas a province in rebellion, broke diplomatic relations with the United States. A few months later, May 1845, the new American president, James Polk, issued orders to the commander of the U.S. Army of Observation, Zachary Taylor, to move his forces into the disputed territory between the Nueces and Rio Grande rivers. In November 1845, Polk sent John Slidell to negotiate with the Mexican authorities. The U.S. Special Envoy sought to settle the issue of the border between Mexico and the United States. Slidell was also instructed to discuss the purchase of the territories of New Mexico and California, something that Mexico was opposed to even consider. John Slidell ultimately failed to get Mexico to negotiate and returned empty-handed to Washington. To force the Mexicans to the negotiation table, James Polk decided to increase the pressure on the Mexican government. Polk instructed Zachary Taylor to move his forces deeper into the disputed territory. Polk was certain this additional pressure would be enough to intimidate Mexico, or at least, provoke Mexico to attack the American army. On March 28, 1846, the Army of Occupation reached the north shore of the Rio Grande and a few days later started the construction of a star-shaped earthwork, later known as Fort Texas. Despite the American pressure, Mexican President Mariano Paredes refused to negotiate. Paredes instead sent reinforcements to the Army of the North. The Mexican president ordered General Mariano Arista to defend Matamoros and expel the American Army of Occupation from the disputed territory. On April 24, Mexican forces crossed the Rio Grande and on April 25, defeated an American patrol at Rancho Carricitos, officially starting hostilities. On May 1, 1846, General Taylor and most of the Army of Occupation departed Fort Texas towards Port Isabel. Taylor wanted to bring back reinforcements, supplies, heavy guns, and ammunition to Fort Texas. The same day, General Arista and most of the Army of the North crossed the Rio Grande to block Taylor's expected return to the American fort. On May 3, the Mexican Army started the siege of Fort Texas. Mexican cannons repeatedly targeted the Americans defending the fort. However, the Mexican fire failed to force the U.S. troops to surrender. When additional American troops arrived at Port Isabel, Taylor and his army marched southward towards Fort Texas. Orista's army was waiting for the Americans on a prairie known as Palo Alto. On May 8, Mexicans and Americans fought from 2.30 p.m. until around 7 p.m. The American artillery inflicted significant losses on the Mexicans, but the U.S. troops failed to dislodge the Army of the North from the road to Matamoros. The next day, May 9, General Arista decided to move his forces to a more defensible position. He realized that fighting on an open field would only favor the Americans, who possessed superior artillery. Arista was also low on ammunition, following the battle the previous day. The Mexican commander sent messengers to Matamoros, requesting General Mejia to forward additional ammunition and supplies. The 
That morning, General Taylor chose not to pursue the Mexican army right away. He decided to leave the close to 300 supply wagons behind. Orders were issued to the American troops to build improvised defenses around the supply train. Lieutenant William Churchill, with his heavy guns, was instructed to stay behind to reinforce the makeshift redoubt. This way, Taylor's army would be able to move faster, without risking the provisions. As these preparations got underway, Colonel Twiggs informed the American commander that many officers in the ranks opposed the idea of re-engaging the Mexicans. Taylor called a council of war to hear what his senior officers recommended. Most of them advised Taylor to stay at Palo Alto and wait for reinforcements. Taylor rejected this idea and decided to continue the preparations to march to Fort Texas. At 7.30 a.m., the American army began their march towards the south, expecting to find Arista's army hiding in the chaparral at the edge of the prairie. Taylor's troops discovered that Arista was not there. At that point, the Americans paused their march, then Taylor sent scouts to look for the Mexicans. When the scouts came back, they reported that Arista's army had left the area. At around 9 a.m., Taylor sent Captain George McCall to find the Mexican army. McCall's was in command of four light infantry companies supplemented by Captain Charles Ferguson Smith's company, Captain Walker with the Texas Rangers, and a small party of dragoons. McCall's force was around 220 men strong. After reaching the Jackass Prairie, McCall sent a messenger to inform Taylor that he had not located Arista's army. The messenger reached Taylor at around noon, and the general finally ordered the bulk of his forces to move forward. They advanced the three miles separating Palo Alto from Jackass Prairie, where they met a small group of McCall's men. They informed Taylor that the captain and the majority of his men had gone further south, searching for Arista's army. After resting for a short time, Taylor and his men continued forward, behind McCall's force. McCall found a Mexican soldier, who informed him that Arista had moved further south, but was not far from there. When McCall was about 150 yards from Resica de la Palma, he came under Mexican artillery fire, which killed one of his men and wounded two others. This confirmed that Arista was positioned nearby, waiting for the Americans. McCall moved out of Mexican range and sent a messenger to inform Taylor of his findings. Now let's rewind for a moment and see what was happening with Arista and his army. After retreating from Palo Alto in the early hours of May 9, Arista reached the Jackass Prairie before noon. He ordered his troops to stop and deploy in the brush on the northern perimeter of the field. His goal was to trap the U.S. forces on the narrow roadway and force them to fight his soldiers hidden in the brush. Effectively, this was the same plan of action he had wanted to use in Palo Alto but had been unable to do so. Captain Jean-Louis Berlandier indicated to Rista that a more defensible position lay about three miles, or five kilometers, farther to the south, at the Resica de la Palma, or Resica de Guerrero, as the Mexicans called it. Berlandier knew the region well, and the Mexican commander followed his advice. The Mexican army reassembled, and at about midday, set off for this new destination. Aresica is the Spanish name given to an old river channel, similar to an oxbow lake, usually surrounded by thick vegetation and filled with stagnant water. An hour later, Arista redeployed his forces at the new site. Once again, due to Arista's decision to relocate, the Mexican soldiers didn't get much time to rest, eat, or drink water. Resica de la Palma did stand out as a superior defensive position. The road was roughly 20 feet broad here, cutting through a patch of exceptionally dense chaparral. The roadway passed over the 50-yard-wide Resica. The brush-covered banks of the Resica provided natural breastworks that offered additional protection to the Mexican soldiers. Arista positioned two eight-pounders and two four-pounders on the north side of the Resica and two additional pieces in the middle of the road to the south. On the right side of the road were the 6th and 10th Infantry Regiments and the Sappers, with the 1st Infantry occupying the extreme right position. 
where the road to tanks de Ramirino crossed the Resica, Aristot positioned two more cannons to prevent passage along this only other known path leading to Fort Texas. To the west of the road to Matamoros, the Tampico Coast Guard, the Veterans Battalion, and the 4th Infantry guarded the Resica with additional sappers on the extreme flank. Behind them, Canela's Defensores de las Villas del Norte, supported by two artillery pieces, watched a narrow trail that led to a pool in the Resica, known as the Charco de la Palma, far to the west. Arista placed the second light infantry as a vanguard force, it held a position on either side of the road several hundred yards ahead of the Resica, the Mexican supply train and Arista's tent were located not far back from the Resica. Finally, at about 300 yards to the south, the Mexican cavalry occupied an opening in the chaparral. Arista was certain that this disposition would shield his forces from the American artillery fire, and at the same time, would force Taylor to rely on an infantry charge. When that occurred, Arista's own artillery would be waiting on the roadway to frustrate the enemy's advance and push the attackers into the brush. Then, his infantry could engage them, at last enjoying the benefit of greater numbers and a sheltered position. Earlier that afternoon, when Arista was informed that McCall's troops were forced to withdraw, the Mexican general concluded that Taylor would not attack that day. Arista put General Diaz de la Vega in charge of the army for the day, and then retired to his tent to write reports and letters to General Mejia in Matamoros. With this, we will end this episode. In the second and final part of this miniseries, we will cover the actual fighting during the Battle of Resica de la Palma. We hope you enjoyed this episode, if you did, click on the like button. If you want to say thanks or encourage us to do more history videos, you can buy us a coffee. The link is in the description below. To make sure you don't miss our future work, subscribe to our channel and activate the notification bell. You can also find additional videos about the Mexican-American War in our YouTube channel. Thank you for your support. See you next time.